I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York City. He's a wealthy small town podiatrist. Millions and millions of dollars. With a beautiful young girlfriend. She had this vision of happily ever after. But there's one thing in their way. You are done! The doctor's wife. <laughs> And the toxic love triangle is about to boil over. She called me a prostitute. You know me she is? Undercover video of her deadly plan. Well, she even says, like, you know, when this is over, you know, we're going to party like no other. And the so-called hired hitman breaks his silence to me. She wore her pants. Yes. Literally. Literally. Then, forget Bridezilla's, this woman killed her fiancé for canceling their wedding. <laughs> Today, from marriage to murder, one of the craziest police interrogations you've ever seen. If you need anything, just give me a heart. Another bottle of red wine and a pack of cigarettes. Right now. Go, let's go. Jason Matero with Crime Watch Daily. I'm Michelle Sedona from Crime Watch Daily. This. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. It's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. You got anything to say? It's Crime Watch Daily. What do you mean you don't know she's 13? You're running away now? Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. First up today, there are divorces and then there are wars. For New York doctor Ira Bernstein and his wife, it was definitely the latter. And the battle over the money got a whole lot more complicated when a very pretty brunette worked her way into the picture. Here's today's top story, a deadly plan. It's a twisted turned toxic love triangle. These people are very well known. The most horrific of all crimes featuring a bitter wife who loved money. Stop lying! You're making me so mad! I think it was a combination of a bad marriage with acid being tossed into the mix. A beautiful, scheming girlfriend who loves someone else's husband. She shopped a lot. Uh, she loved a lot of money. She wanted in on the gravy train. She definitely wanted in. And a wealthy foot doctor who was about to step in it. Big time. You can't make that up. Almost everyone in Rockland County, New York, knows Ira Bernstein. He was a big shot in town, who amassed a small fortune as a real estate tycoon and the local podiatrist. He had a significant amount of uh, cash flow, uh, millions and millions of dollars. The good doctor even treated the entire fleet of feet at the Ramapo Police Department. He was not unknown to this police department. Detective Fitzgerald and myself were one patients. of his patients. He treated you? Yep. And you were happy with his services? Yes. Dr. Bernstein was as well known for his War of the Roses with his wife as he was for his healing hands. Susan Bernstein would threaten to have Ira arrested while they were married. There's audio tape to support that. Don't bother coming back! You're going to you and There were phone recordings on both sides. But there are some of Dr. Bernstein threatening her life. Yes, repeatedly. You want to yell at me? I'll just hang up on you. You're crazy. You are done! In the battle over the family fortune, the Bernsteins stay married but began living separate lives. Police say it didn't take long for the foot doctor to develop a fetish for a sexy ex-mortician named Kelly Grabolik. She was a funeral director. She was. The 35-year-old beauty had just come out of her own nasty divorce and even uglier custody dispute. A little TLC from Ira was a prescription for romance. How did Kelly and Ira meet? Kelly and Ira met originally when Kelly was a patient of Ira's. They were romantic. They were. Kelly was known as a model citizen in Rockland County, but cops did know her name. She had been involved in a tragic death. Kelly had been in a fatal car accident before, where she was driving. She was driving, she struck a pedestrian, and uh, was not charged with a crime. As far as you could tell, that was an accident? Yes. Cops tell me Kelly fell hard for the wealthy podiatrist, and eventually took a job at one of his medical centers. In fact, she's even seen driving around town in his Maserati. She loved Ira Bernstein. When the wife gets wind of her husband's sexy young girlfriend, she files for divorce. Get out with your girlfriend in the Bahamas! 
I'm with my mom in Florida. Stop lying! But they decide to stay married for the love of money. As Susan Bernstein would put it, um, Ira didn't want to divide up his empire. I think he felt it was unfair. And he expressed that to his girlfriend, Kelly, as well. Ira was now becoming more and more frustrated, and Kelly didn't like seeing the love of her life so upset. I think she wanted to please Ira and had this vision of her and Ira living together with um, a lot of money. So cops say Kelly hatched an evil plan to get rid of the one thing standing in the way of their happily ever after, Ira's wife. Do you think she really wanted to have Susan Bernstein killed? Absolutely. No question. No, no doubt. She comes from uh, little means. She stood to gain um, fancy cars, big houses, you know, the stature to be with the doctor. All Kelly needed was a hitman to arrange the murder. So she went shopping. She was shopping this hit. She was shopping the hit. She was. Who does that? Kelly Gribbelick. Police say Kelly was determined to get the job done, claiming she propositioned three different people. They all say no, and then Kelly runs into an old buddy. While Kelly was shopping for a car at BMW in Rockland County, she started a, a conversation with Markenzie Lusant. Car salesman. Car salesman, absolutely. A car salesman by day. Uh, according to Kelly, he was a hitman by night. Markenzie Lusant had once sold Kelly a car. What was Markenzie asked to do? Markenzie was asked if he knew anybody that can help take out the client's boyfriend's wife. Markenzie and Kelly begin covert meetings at this parking lot. Believe it or not, it's right across from one of Dr. Bernstein's offices and the police station. Catching a plan to take Ira's wife out. What Kelly doesn't know is Markenzie's car has a special feature. It's secretly wired with cameras. It would appear from these audio and videotapes that Kelly was very serious about finding someone to kill Ira's wife. I think she was very determined. How mean she is? She called me a prostitute. How mean she is? They even devised a despicable and eerily familiar plan of how to off Susan. Was that like a run like when she was getting out of a car or like playing an accent and they backed up into her and the guy stayed and says I didn't see her you know I was playing an accent so there's no investigation what was the plot supposed to be the original plot was to try to be in a car accident where she gets run off the road or struck Susan the wife being dead right and have the other driver that struck her stay on the scene and have the police take an accident report and no one's the wise. Make it go away. Right. It has to be an accident. It can't be a robbery. It can't figure out there's a camera yeah. in the car. Like, it's got to be real clean. Kelly had been in an accident when she was younger where someone was killed. That is correct. Was this just an irony, or did this play into the actual scheme? It very well is ironic. After nearly a dozen meetings, the car salesman makes Kelly an offer she can't refuse. They negotiated. Yes, they did. A hundred grand. It, it actually started off at two hundred thousand, came quickly down to one hundred thousand dollars for price on Susan Bernstein's head. You said you want a couple of jeans, right? Yeah. You know. If you want to, uh, after you get up to be safe, if you want to feel comfortable when you get up the car. But where would a single mom come up with that kind of money? Turns out, it was what the doctor ordered. Up next. Ira Bernstein wanted two things. He wanted his wife dead, but he wanted 100% guarantee that he was going to get away with it. The one thing that turns out to be the podiatrist's Achilles heel. Was Mark Kenzie a legitimate hitman? We're back with more on today's story, A Deadly Plan. $100,000 for one dead wife. That's the deal laid out for a would-be hitman. The offer negotiated by the new girlfriend of a rich doctor, unhappy in his marriage. Unfortunately for the devious duo, the entire deal would be caught on hidden camera. I, I've never done this 
Kelly Grabillock, the girlfriend of wealthy New York podiatrist Ira Bernstein, is proposing a devilish deal to luxury car salesman Markenzie Lusant. She's losing. She just won't let go. She won't divorce them. But it's not to buy a new car. It's to take her lover's estranged wife out. We have to shoot her. Would that be okay? You've got a prominent doctor dating a woman who goes to a car salesman and says, I need somebody to help kill my boyfriend's soon-to-be ex-wife. The way this whole story unfolds, you just couldn't make any of it up. The only foolproof way to make sure that happened, we could disable the car. And... The murder for hire seemed to be the sole sadistic idea of the jealous girlfriend. I think she had an intent to replace Susan Bernstein. But it turns out Kelly was just following the doctor's orders. That's Dr. Bernstein prescribing the lethal hit and run that would kill his wife, Susan. He got in the car with a hitman and started talking about how he wanted his wife killed. And just as importantly to him was that he not be investigated and not get caught. What was the motivation for having Susan Bernstein killed? Money. Plain and simple. Plain and simple money. To his neighbors in Rockland County, New York, the doctor was a medical genius. But behind the surgical mask, cops claim he was a greedy monster willing to do anything to save his fortune. He was a local doctor, ostensibly successful at his practice. But when you took a closer look at his books, it became clear that there were a lot of improprieties. In fact, two insurance adjusters actually launched an extensive investigation into Bernstein's medical practice. Cops claimed they found something fishy indeed was going on with the foot doctor. In what way? Billing for patients that actually weren't in the office, billing for procedures that didn't take place, things of that nature. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes. I think he always went for more money. I think that's why he got involved with the insurance uh, fraud. Some media reports suggest Susan Bernstein found out about her husband's shady business and began blackmailing him unless he signed over half his multi-million dollar fortune to her in a divorce. Father coming back, you're like a <laughs> When he saw that that was being taken away from him by his ex-wife, I think it drove him over the edge. Detectives believe the doctor began using his pretty young mistress, Kelly, as a puppet to do his dirty work while he pulled the strings safely from his operating room. Kelly was a pawn, in my opinion. Kelly Bribolook was Ira Bernstein's way of getting out of his marriage with every penny that he had before Susan died. He's not comfortable with giving the 50, but he figured everything was done. Everything's done by Kelly. Kelly is the person he puts out front, so if anything goes wrong, Kelly's going to be the one that goes down. He's being smart that way. The $100,000 hit on Susan seems to be a go. And suddenly, Kelly tells Markenzie the podiatrist may be having a change of heart. Cops say the doctor didn't have a change of heart. He was starting to smell a rat, wondering if Markenzie was really an undercover cop. Was she suspicious? Yes. I think they both were suspicious. All of a sudden, there's a new twist in the deadly deal. Out of nowhere, it was like, hey, we need two insurance investigators beat up now. Kelly offers Markenzie another $5,000 to have the two insurance adjusters investigating Dr. Bernstein's practice roughed up. If the doctor is satisfied with the results, he will move forward with Susan's murder. We believe that this was a test. If he was a police officer, it wasn't going to happen. And if he was not a police officer, then he would get these two people beat up and put out of work to the point where they couldn't continue their investigation into him at that time. And just a few days later, Markenzie requests an appointment with the doctor, saying he wants to personally show the doctor he's executed his orders. Dr. Bernstein is clearly paranoid he's being watched. No, I'm just saying if there are cameras. And he got inside, he was just saying, listen, I'm just scared, I'm nervous about it. And then something happens that gives the podiatrist a severe case of cold feet. The doctor gets suspicious, even thinks he sees a camera. 
Not only does he think he sees the camera, he actually does see the camera. It's right there, buried in the back seat. It was a great shot. He points right at it. He goes, what is that? Up next. The doctor kept looking at it. The podiatrist puts his foot in his mouth. He goes, you know, I don't want to end up on television. As in an investigative yeah. journalism show. And the car salesman turns spin doctor. When Kelly first looked at those pictures, the first thing she said was, these look like cop pictures. This is the moment that a murder for hire case almost went sideways. A wealthy doctor looks straight into the hidden camera filming him as he sets up the calculated killing of his estranged wife. Today, I talk to the man in the driver's seat during the deal, the would-be hitman. Dr. Ira Bernstein wanted to permanently silence his estranged wife, Susan, who he claims is a greedy nag. I'm with my mom in Florida. Stop lying! So he and his younger mistress, Kelly Grabelluk, hire who they think is a hitman, Marquenzie Lusant, to murder Susan. His credentials? He's a car salesman Kelly had known for years. He just wants to know the main thing. To prove Markenzie is the real deal and not a police informant, Kelly and the doc first asked the salesman to rough up two insurance adjusters who had been investigating Bernstein's podiatry practice for fraud. A few days later, Markenzie delivers these chilling photos. When Kelly first looked at those pictures, the first thing she said was, these, these look like cop pictures. Why did she go through with that? The emotions were, were outweighing everything else that they were going through. Here's where the podiatrist and his girlfriend take the bait. He was satisfied with the beating that these two insurance investigators received. Yes, he was. And they look realistic. They do the, look realistic. The artists worked, had worked on that movie, FX. That's right. These pictures are fake. We took numerous pictures, you know, hundreds of pictures, and just so we can get one of each person being beat up that, that looked more realistic. Did he pay the money? Yeah, we, yeah the, the, money was the money was paid. So who ratted out the foot doctor and his girlfriend's murder for hire plot? Was Markenzie a legitimate hitman? He's not a hitman, he's, he's a good man. A good man who blew the whistle. You were the man for the job. Uh, I pretended to be. Markenzie tells me Kelly came into the luxury car dealership and asked if he knew anyone who could kill her boyfriend's wife. She was very clear about it. She was very clear and blunt about it. What made you go to police? When I look at her facial expression and I know she was serious. He was the fourth person that they had contacted to kill Susan Bernstein, and he's the only one that went to the police. The only one? Only one. They were going to keep hunting until they found somebody who was going to do it. The Ramapo police asked the car salesman to close the biggest deal of his life, getting both Kelly and Ira to map out their murder for hire plot on camera. This is all new to you. All new to me. Did you ever think your life was in danger? Yes. Especially at this moment. At one point, the doctor actually sees the hidden camera. Yes. Markenzie reassures the doctor and Kelly he's simply a salesman with a tricked out car. It was a great shot. He points right at it. He goes, what is that? And what does Markenzie say? He says, well, that's what my kids, they plug into and uh, for their headsets. So the doctor kept looking at it. He stared back and he says, I don't want to end up on television. I don't want to end up on television. Yeah. As in an investigative yeah. journalism show. That camera Dr. Bernstein discovered in Markenzie's back seat was actually set by the cops to catch the deal of death on tape. And it didn't take Kelly long. One step closer, you understand? No. <laughs> One step closer, we'll be okay. Okay, here's the deposit. Let me get you the A-OK okay next week. The recordings gave the Ramapo police all the evidence they needed to arrest Kelly for conspiracy to murder Ira's wife. But cops sit tight until they've got enough to nail the doctor, too. At one point, she even says, like, you know, when this is over, you know, we're going to party like no other. But the foot doctor had wisely tiptoed around Markenzie. He never verbally gives the final go ahead. Up until that moment, it was Kelly Gribbeluk who was the mouthpiece for the conspiracy on Ira's behalf. 
We did have prior to that her meeting with him and uh, video and photographs of that, but it wasn't enough to actually charge him. So when Markenzie shows the doc the pictures of the two busted up insurance adjusters, police ask him to set the final trap. You want this done by the weekend? Give or take. I mean, it doesn't have to be done this weekend, but, you know. Okay. My guy definitely would get it done. Markenzie says, listen, I need to know. We need to have some sort of conclusion here. You know, either I'm out or, you know, but it's your decision. It has to be your decision. Cops say that's when the good doctor shoots himself in the foot. And he makes me say, he says, if it comes from Kelly, it came from me. Detectives tell me Kelly showed up a few days later and simply typed the word yes into her phone. How important was that to your case? It was very important. There was a few critical moments, and that was one of them. So he wanted you to kill his wife, Susan. Mm -hmm. With that, the detectives swoop in and nab the doctor and his mistress, interrogating both at the same time in separate rooms. It was a bad thing what you guys were doing. Really bad. You're going to be charged with a solicitation to solicit someone to go kill Susan. Up next, the brilliant doctor plays dumb. So that's with medicine. And bails on his mistress. He didn't bail Kelly out. No. You're willing to take the fall for him? That's how much you love him? Now to the conclusion of today's story, a deadly plan. Ira Bernstein, a not-so-good doctor, and his greedy girlfriend are in cuffs, both arrested and accused of trying to hire a hitman to kill the foot doctor's wife. But who will go down for the crime? When Kelly Grabulik typed these three simple letters, Y-E-S, into her phone, cops say it spelled murder. Do you think she really wanted to have Susan Bernstein killed? Absolutely. Yes, definitely. No question. Ramapo detectives claim that was a direct message, not from the mistress, but from Dr. Ira Bernstein himself ordering the hit. Do you think he would have really paid $100,000 to have his soon-to-be ex-wife killed? Yeah, I think he has, the, he has the money to do so. It was enough for prosecutors to charge the would-be killer lovebirds with conspiracy to commit murder. But cops still needed Kelly to cooperate, fingering the foot doctor as the real mastermind behind the scheme. We had to be sure that Dr. Bernstein was involved fully as well. So cops put together their own elaborate plan to get Kelly to rat out her lover. When Kelly was arrested, yes. the police put you in this holding cell. Yes. So she could see you. Yes. Remember, Kelly has no idea the car salesman she hired as a hitman, Markenzie Lusant, is really a police informant. The plan was to go have her walk past and see him and say, oh my gosh, they have the hitman. It's over. Did she look at you? Yes. And what was the look on her face? She basically changed color. And I believe she had, uh, excuse me, was saying it, she had peed herself. She wet her pants? Yes. Literally? Literally. Right here. Kelly and Dr. Bernstein are put in separate interrogation rooms. And now comes the game of good cop, bad cop. Kelly's your girlfriend? Yeah, I see Kelly, huh? Yeah. She's a nice girl. I'm very nice. pretty, she's a pretty girl, too. And, but I think you two just got caught up in this big web of whatever was happening and, and kind of got out of control. You have more charges than he's going to have. It was a bad thing what you guys were doing. Really bad. Continually pitting one against the other. Kelly just gave us everything. She's crumbled. He's going to be coming in here, and he's going to tell us, wow, I can't believe Kelly did this. The bigger one picture is what you were going to do to Susan. You're never going to do this to Susan. You're never going to do anything to Susan. And you never intended it. Kelly backs up the doctor's story. She claims they never intended to follow through with a hit, but tells detectives the hitman wouldn't take no for an answer. Why was he pressuring me so much? Why did he he's... keep calling me and pressuring me? Well, that's not the way it went down. He even threatened to feed them to alligators if they didn't pay up. Fed to the alligators. Fed to the alligators. A terrifying threat for sure, but there are just two major flaws with that story. First, where are you going to find alligators in Ramapo, New York? And the bigger issue, Markenzie wasn't really a hitman. Markenzie's not even in trouble because there's more to this, okay? Markenzie's with us. Still, cops can't get Kelly or Ira to crack. Am I done? Am I finished for life? Am I finished for life? That's going to depend on you right now. I, I, I can't answer any questions at a lawyer here. 
After that, the doctor posts bail. It turns out to be the break cops are looking for. They both went to jail for a few days, and Dr. Bernstein bailed himself out. And Kelly stayed in prison. He didn't bail Kelly out? No. Detectives tell his mistress her lover is bailing out on her while she rots behind bars. He's free. He can always go back to his big house with his wife, but you, you're disposable. Was she bitter that Ira bailed out of jail and she was left in jail for some period of time? I believe she was. But after four months of sitting in a jail cell, the stewing mistress suddenly has a change of heart. Your relationship with him is over. It's done. And he is separating himself from you right now. He's putting this all on you. Why did she decide to be a cooperating witness for the prosecution? Ira Bernstein, in her mind, left her in jail while he was out. And um, I don't think she, at that time, felt the need to protect him anymore. What was the game plan? Was it the shooter? No. What was it? Grabolik finally flips, confirming it was Bernstein's idea to off his wife. She just helped execute the plan. What was the word written in there? Yes. That's giving the go-ahead. So the case was closed, right? Well, not so fast. The prosecution's key witness is finally let out of jail, and you'll never believe where she ends up. They move in together. That's right. She ran straight back into the arms of Dr. Ira Bernstein. I believe that night they actually moved in together. So you as a prosecutor have your cooperating witness living with, dining with, sleeping with the target of your investigation. That's true. Even after she agreed to testify against him? Yes. He never held that against her. But sleeping with the enemy left the podiatrist without a legal leg to stand on. How did this complicate the prosecution of Dr. Bernstein? While Kelly and I were living together, um, she became less and less cooperative the closer we got. On the other hand, it greatly helped the prosecution in this case because it made it impossible for Ira Bernstein to point the finger at Kelly Gribbelook at trial. Dr. Bernstein decided to plead guilty and received a 5 to 15 year prison sentence. Kelly Gribbola got 4 to 12 years in exchange for her testimony. And how was Susan Bernstein during this investigation? She didn't know anything about it. How did she react? They both told us that she said she paused and then said, I'm not surprised. What is a surprise? Through it all, Susan and Ira are still legally married. Are you glad you did what you did? I would do it all over again. Do you think if Kelly had approached a real hitman, Susan Bernstein would be dead today? Absolutely. No question. No, no doubt. Believe it or not, Kelly could be eligible for parole as early as next year. Her attorney tells us that the doctor and his lover's relationship is stronger now than when they first got arrested, and they plan to reunite when they're both free. Up next, did a broken engagement cause this bride-to-be to snap? I hope you're dead, because if anything, anyone who deserves to be dead all of this, it's you, you Crime Watch Daily with the chilling and bizarre interrogation after two bodies are found. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for Coming up. I've seen a lot of police interrogation videos in my day, but never have I seen a murder suspect ask the police for a bottle of red wine and a pack of cigarettes. You can probably guess what the answer was. For more on the story behind that video, we head to the Northeast and the beautiful city of Brattleboro, Vermont. Here is Anna Garcia. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Yes! But did this woman really kill her fiance for calling off their wedding? Steve! <laughs> Love you. <laughs> Love you, you. A crazy intoxicated interrogation room scene unfolds. If you need anything, just give me a hole. I'm gonna get out of the wall, okay? Oh, uh, well, how about Another bottle of red wine and a pack of cigarettes. 
more liquor was the last thing this lovesick woman needed. Just hours earlier, her fiance and his son were shot dead. I don't remember a thing except standing over bodies with lots and lots of blood. Police learned about the killings when a man calls 911. I just had a phone call from a co-worker who tells me that she just shot and killed her boyfriend and his son. Townsend, Vermont cops find Stephen Lott with 12 gunshot wounds. His 28-year-old son, Jameis, shot three times. Also at the house, Robin O'Neill. Are both my fiance, Steve, and his middle son, Jameis, both dead? I don't know right now, okay? Well, I don't see how they couldn't be. Investigators hauled Robin in for a questioning session like no other. Where exactly am I? Cops realize immediately she's highly intoxicated, at times confused, at other times seemingly quite aware of the trouble she's in. No! 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 This can't possibly be Robin claims she didn't remember a thing, but whatever did happen, she knew she wanted to take it back. Is there anything else I can get you? <laughs> Yesterday, thank you. If you need some more water, Yesterday would be very good. If Robin wasn't going back in time, then there was something else she wanted. Actually, if you could get me. <laughs> loaded nine millimeter or something and if she had indeed killed her fiance robin wanted detectives to know why it was this morning on our way to work that he said we were disengaged not getting married it was an admission she quickly regretted i'm thinking this is something where i need a public defender or something because i've just given you motive Less than a year earlier, Robin had moved from Texas to Vermont to be with Stephen. Now he was calling off their engagement. Stephen! Stephen, it seemed the more she thought about her situation, the more angry she became. I hope you're dead. Because if anything, anyone who deserves to be dead, all of this, it's you. Cursing one minute, praying the next. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for Jesus. Then Robin told detectives how they could better understand her story. My so-called diary and my computer could shed a whole lot of light on this. Robin's personal diary did shed light on the case at her trial three years later. Prosecutors used it to document the demise of her relationship, but it turns out Robin sobered up big time. Of course, I need a public defender. Uh, I'm I need not sure what I need right now, so. Yeah, I need a public defender. And none of her statements made to police that night could be used in court. A judge ruling detectives ignored Robin's request for an attorney and questioned her anyway. The only confession jurors heard about was the one she made to her friend the night of the murders. She said, Steve, by my feet in a pool of blood, and Janice is under the table in his own pool. An expert for the defense testified that Robin was creating false memories when she confessed and was testing the assertion to see if it fit. The defense reminded jurors Robin was drunk at the time and didn't remember killing anyone. They also claimed there was virtually no forensic or physical evidence against her. DNA is a powerful new scientific tool for criminal investigations. What do you think that the law enforcement tested for DNA in this particular case? 
Defense attorney Ian Carlton said there wasn't enough evidence collected to connect anyone to the murders. They didn't test the drinking glasses. There were drinking glasses all over the kitchen. There were beer cans. There were wine glasses. They didn't test cigarette butts. They didn't test doorknobs, faucets, strings. Her defense team also argued that if Robin had been the killer, she would have been covered in blood, but there was none on her clothes. They tested the three guns that were found in the kitchen. They tested the, the bullets that were found in the kitchen, and that's it. Prosecutors told jurors while they may have doubts about parts of this case, there are no reasonable doubts. In the end, the jury agreed, even without seeing her initial interrogation. Oh, well, how about another bottle of red wine and a pack of cigarettes? Robin O'Neill was found guilty of aggravated murder, carrying an automatic sentence of life without parole. Under Vermont state law, she's entitled to an automatic appeal. Up next, Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. He's the fertility doctor grilled by our Elizabeth Smart, accused of using his own sperm to impregnate his patients. I wondered if you wanted to share no, your side. No, thank you. Today, there's been a big development in the case. I'm ecstatic. I couldn't be any more happy. That's next. Now to a Crime Watch Daily update on a story we covered in Indiana. That's where a fertility doctor confessed in court documents to using his own sperm with his patients, not once or twice, but as many as 50 times. Our Elizabeth Smart is here now with the very latest. Chris, I can't even imagine the horror at finding out that the man you trusted with something so special as having a baby was allegedly committing a horrible betrayal behind closed doors. Dramatic new information breaking in the case of the alleged fertility Frankenstein. I'm ecstatic. I couldn't be any more happy. Dr. Donald Klein is accused of impregnating dozens of patients with his own sperm. It's a story Crime Watch Daily has been following closely. Liz White is one of several moms who is making the sensational claim that Dr. Donald Klein artificially inseminated them with his own sperm. It gives me creeps that when he left the room after the initial coming in and putting on the drape, that he went out saying he was going to go get the donor sperm. And then what occurred outside the room, that was disgusting. Liz tells our Elizabeth Smart Klein told her medical students would provide a fresh donation because frozen sperm was not an option. I think if he said, well, I'm going to donate my semen to you, I would have, like, been creeped out. Nine months later, Liz gave birth to a healthy baby boy she named Matthew. It was a blessing. Fast forward 15 years later. We were in science class learning about what my blood type was based upon my parents. And so when I brought that topic up to ask them what their blood types are, um, that's when they, they, they told me. Matt says he did his own DNA test. He sent it to the online testing site 23andMe.com, so named for the 23 chromosomes in a human cell. Do you remember how many siblings it said you had, or half siblings? I think the total confirmed, unconfirmed account is 13 right now. Jacoba Ballard says she's one of Matt's half-sisters. Like Matt, Jacoba did her own DNA saliva test. The first set um, proved that there were, I had seven siblings. Julie Maines, another of Dr. Klein's alleged daughters, did her own DNA test and says the results showed Jacoba is her half-sister. It was very mind-blowing and shocking, to say the least. Jacoba recorded this shocking phone call in which Klein admits he donated his own sperm on several occasions. I only donated my own sample maybe nine or ten times. Jacoba shared the recording with prosecutors. In my 10 years of practicing law, I'd definitely put it in the top 10. According to the probable cause affidavit, Klein denied everything, telling investigators, I can emphatically say that at no time did I ever use my own sample for insemination, nor was I a donor. Prosecutors concluded Klein lied to investigators. 
He was charged with two counts of obstruction of justice. We wanted to get Dr. Klein's side of the story, so our Elizabeth Smart tracked him down at his home. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. Hi. Hi. I'm Elizabeth Smart. I'm from Crime Watch Daily. I had the opportunity to speak to a couple of your children, and I heard their side of the story, and I wondered if you wanted to share no, your side. No, thank you. You'll have to speak to my attorney. Klein had pleaded not guilty to the charges, but now in a shocking new development, Klein will change his plea to guilty, according to his attorneys. Our Indianapolis news partner, Fox 59, was at the courthouse with Jacoba and some of her alleged siblings. We're in this together and it's not just me, it's everyone, it's all of our moms. Klein reportedly has asked God for forgiveness, but for this half-brother and his half-sisters, Forgetting is something that isn't in their DNA.